Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to go over the second part of the respiratory system. So breathing or pulmonary ventilation is the mechanical act of breathing in and out. Inspiration is period of airflow into the lungs and expiration is period when gases leave the lungs. Respiratory pressures are always going to be described in relative to atmospheric pressures. If we take a look at this picture here, what you'll notice is that there's more gas particles down here at lower altitudes than there is up here at a higher altitude. That is because of the force of gravity acting on the particles that are present in the air. At lower altitudes, you're going to have higher pressures, and at higher altitudes, you're going to have lower pressures. So what is atmospheric pressure? Um, it is pressure exerted by gases surrounding a body. At sea level, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury or 1 atm. So what does that mean in terms of respiratory pressures? Well, if you have a negative respiratory pressure, it indicates that the pressure is lower than that of the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure in the lungs is going to be lower than that of the atmosphere. For example, a negative four millimeter mercury uh, pressure, respiratory pressure, indicates that it is lower than the atmospheric pressure by four millimeters of mercury. A positive respiratory pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. And if the respiratory pressure is equal to zero, it, is, it means that it is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Here are some um, definitions to remember. Intrapulmonary pressure, also called intraalveolar pressure, this is the pressure inside of your lungs, inside the alveoli of your lungs and it's going to fluctuate with breathing. It's going to change slightly, but it, is, it always eventually equalizes with the atmospheric pressure. Intrapleural pressure, pressure in the pleural cavity. Remember, this is a cavity. A pleural cavity is a cavity that surrounds your lungs. You had that saran wrap-like sheets that are surrounding your lungs. That's the pleura. And this is also, that has a pressure of its own, and it also fluctuates with breathing, but it is always negative to the intrapulmonary pressure. It makes sense. If you have something wrapped around your lungs, you don't want it to have higher pressure than your lungs. That would cause your lungs to collapse. So when something is surrounding your lungs, you want the pressure of that to be lower than your lungs, so it doesn't squeeze your lungs. This is just a reminder of what the pleura looks like. Remember, it's gonna be this double layer, balloon-like structure that's going to surround your lungs. Transpulmonary pressure is the pressure between those two. So the difference between intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressure. This pressure keeps the lungs from collapsing, so it keeps the air sacs open. Now here's something important to remember. Any condition that equalizes intrapleural pressure with intrapulmonary pressure, or in other words, atmospheric pressure, causes the lungs to immediately collapse. So you want the pressure inside the pleura to be less than pressure inside the lungs. If it equalizes or becomes greater, it will cause the lungs to collapse. Again, pulmonary ventilation is just the act of breathing in and out. It is a mechanical process, and it does depend on changes in volume in your thoracic cavity. So here's, um, we're going to go over this in detail, but volume change results in pressure changes and results in changes in flow of gases. Here is Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law, um, 
states the relationship between pressure and volume of gases, pressure and volume of gases at a constant temperature. There is an inverse relationship between the two. And by the way, don't worry about memorizing this formula. So let's look at this container over here and this container over here. So let's say there are the same amount of gas particles in both of these containers. Here, this is a larger container, therefore a larger volume. But the pressure is going to be lower in this container over here. Why? Because there is more space between these particles. So they don't bounce against each other or they don't bounce against the walls of this container very frequently. However, let's say we decrease the volume of this container to here. So now you have the same amount of particles in there, but the container is smaller. So now these particles are bouncing against each other more frequently. They're bouncing against the walls of this container more frequently. Therefore, pressure has increased. So inverse relationship. When volume increases, pressure decreases. When volume in, uh, decreases, the pressure is going to increase. So this is going to be an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. When one goes up, the other one goes down. Before we um, go any further, it's really important to keep this relationship in mind. Also remember diffusion. Gases always follow their pressure gradient. This happens without any type of energy put into it. This is just how gases operate in nature. Everything flows from high pressure to low pressure and also from high concentration to low concentration. Let's see what happens when you're inhaling inspiration. So let's see what happens with the diaphragm. The action of the diaphragm, when you inhale, it's going to contract and move inferiorly. It's actually going to drop and become more flat. And that will cause an increase in the height of the thoracic cavity. And also something else to keep you in mind. Go ahead and take a deep breath in. And notice your chest. You'll notice that your rib cage is going to move upwards. And that is because whenever you inhale, the external intercostal muscles, these are going to be muscles in between your ribs, they're going to contract and lift your rib cage upwards. Let's look at this uh, diagram or picture over here. And we were looking at what happens when you inhale. Okay, this muscle over here is the diaphragm. This is the muscle that the lungs are sitting on. So what you'll notice here is what happened is it contracted and what happens when it contracts, it's going to drop and become more flat. So what does that do to your lungs? Well, when it drops and it becomes more flat, it increases the volume in your thoracic cavity, therefore increases the volume of the lungs. If you compare these two, you'll notice that the volume of the lungs has increased. So this is going to cause an increase to lung volume. And now let's remember Boyle's Law. What happens when the volume increases? Well, volume increase, pressure decreased. And when the pressure decreases, actually it drops slightly below of that in the atmospheric pressure. So now you have pressure outside of the lungs that are a little bit higher than pressure inside of the lungs. And we know that gases are going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. So they're going to 
move from high pressure outside of the lungs to low pressure inside of the lungs. And that's what happens when you inhale. Now, what's, what happens when you exhale? Well, the diaphragm relaxes and it rises. It becomes dome-shaped and it decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity. The intercostal muscles, those muscles in your, between your ribs, they're going to relax and it's going to allow the thoracic cavity to drop, your rib cage to drop. So if you exhale, you notice your chest when you're exhaling, you'll notice that your rib cage drops down. Let's look at this diagram over here. Again, this is going to be the diaphragm. And here it has relaxed and it became dome shaped. This is kind of counterintuitive for some people because they think, um, for some reason, they think if it contracts, it's going to move up. But when it, con when it contracts, it drop drops down. And when it relaxes, it becomes dome-shaped. That's something to remember. Um, so now that it has become dome-shaped, it has decreased the volume of the thoracic cavity and decreased the volume of the lungs. So you can see it's here it's going to be a decrease in lung volume. Going back to Boyle's Law, what happens when volume is decreased? Well, pressure now inside of the lungs is going to increase. And it increases slightly above atmospheric pressure. And again, gases are going to flow from high pressure to low. So they're going to leave your lungs. If you didn't quite understand this, I recommend that maybe you pause the video and go back and watch this a few more times. It does take some repetition to understand it. These are some non-respiratory um, air movements in your body, things like coughing, sneezing, crying, laughing, hiccups, or yawns, and they alter the normal respiratory rhythm. Respiratory capacities tell us something about a person's respiratory health. This is a spirometer, and this is really old one. Occasionally, we use it in lab because it is easy to use, but in medicine, they use much more sophisticated and advanced types of spirometers. So lung volume and lung capacities are often abnormal in people with pulmonary disorders. And a machine called spirometer is used to calculate a person's lung capacities. These are definitely important things to remember, especially by definition. They could appear on both lecture and lab. So tidal volume, TV, is breathing at rest. So right now, if you're sitting down and just watching this video, what's happening in your body is tidal volume. This is 500, about 500 milliliters of air, which is moving in and out of your lungs. So normal, quiet breathing. Inspiratory reserve volume, this is the maximum amount of air that can be inspired forcibly beyond the tidal volume. So you have to be, to measure this, first you're going to be breathing very normally, and then you take a very deep breath in, and you try to inhale as much air as you possibly can. That is going to be your inspiratory reserve volume. Expiratory reserve volume is basically forced exhalation after normal quiet breathing. This one is tricky when we're doing it in lab because 
when people know they're going to be exhaling really hard, what they typically do is inhale really hard first. So they could exhale as hard as they can. That's not correct. What you need to do is breathe in very normally as you would in the tidal volume and exhale as hard as you can. So you're going to sit there, um, breathe as normally as you possibly can, and then exhale as hard as you can. That's going to be your expiratory reserve volume. Residual volume is the air that remains in the lungs and helps keep the alveoli of the lungs from collapsing. This is the amount of air that you cannot get out of your lungs. Um, no matter how hard you exhale, it's there to prevent your lungs from collapsing. It's a good idea to remember this graph, especially these over here. This shows tidal volume, about 500 milliliters. This is, by the way, in males, not females. And with every person, there are, there's going to be some fluctuations. And that doesn't necessarily mean, mean that there's some abnormality going on in the pulmonary system. Um, tidal volume right here, this is breathing at rest. Inspiratory reserve volume, forced in in um, forced inhalation, basically. Expiratory reserve volume, this is forced exhalation. Residual volume, which we can't measure because it's in your lungs. And it's a good idea to remember these two maybe. Uh, the total amount of exchangeable air um, in and out of your lungs, that's called vital capacity. And everything together, including residual volume, makes the total lung capacity. And by the way, um, it might not be a bad idea to remember the abbreviations for these. You guys could probably maybe print this out and practice, or maybe you could pause the video right here and see if you could label these. Now there's two more um, laws to talk about. There's Dalton's Law and Henry's Law. Dalton's law of partial pressure states that the total pressure exerted by a mixture of gases is a sum of pressures exerted independently by each gas in the mixture. Partial pressure is the pressure exerted by a particular gas. Partial pressure is directly proportional to the percentage of that gas in the mixture. And um, putting it in the simplest term I can possibly put it, this means that the more of a particular gas you have in the atmosphere, the more that gas is going to contribute to the overall pressure. So here you could see, here's the partial pressure of oxygen, here's the partial pressure of nitrogen, and when we add these two, that makes the total partial pressure um, of the combination of two gases. So this shows um, the the relative percentage of gases in the atmosphere. As you could see, nitrogen is the gas that contributes most to atmospheric pressure. Second one is oxygen, and the third one is argon. And then we have a little bit of all these gases over here as well. Henry's law, this one might be a little confusing, but I'll try to simplify it as much as possible, um, states that when a gas is in contact with a liquid, that gas will dissolve in the liquid in proportional to its partial pressure. Accordingly, the greater the concentration of a particular gas in the gas phase, the more and faster that gas will go into the solution, into the liquid. Let's look at this. What it's really saying is when we have a lot of gases here in the atmosphere, the faster and more proportionally, it's going to diffuse into the liquid. The less of the gas you have, the less will diffuse. And as you can see, because we have more of this gas here, the higher the pressure of that gas, the faster it's going to diffuse. Less of this gas, less of the pressure, it's not going to diffuse as fast or as much. That's basically what it's stating. At equilibrium, the partial pressure in the gas and the liquid phases are the same. 
let's go back to the picture again. Equilibrium would mean we have the same amount of gases here in the atmosphere than we do here in the liquid. It doesn't mean that there's none of them dissolving into the liquid and none of them going back into the gas phase. It's still, those gases are still moving in and out of those phases. The difference is you're having the same amount dissolving in and going out into the gas form. So coming in and going out are equal. That's what equilibrium means. And everything in nature is trying to reach equilibrium. However, if the partial pressure of gas in the liquid becomes greater, some of the dissolved gas molecules will re-enter the gaseous phase. As I just said, everything in nature tries to be in equilibrium. Um, it doesn't like, nature doesn't like that imbalance. So let's say you have too much of these gas particles dissolving in the, into the liquid, and now you have more here in the liquid than you do in the gas phase. Well, because nature doesn't like imbalances, some of them are going to dissolve out of this liquid form so that there is equilibrium. Again, this all has to do with diff diffusion, things moving from high concentration to low concentration, and trying to reach equilibrium, and trying to reach a balance. Okay, we talked um, in the previous video briefly about what external respiration is. This is pulmonary gas exchange, and this is where um, color change in your red blood cells are going to happen in the lungs. So you're going to have these red blood cells that are low in oxygen traveling to your lungs. They travel to the capillary of your lungs. They're going to pick up oxygen, become that scarlet red colored. Um, and they're going to be ready to travel to various or organs and tissues in your body to provide them with oxygen. So this process of red blood cells going into your lungs and picking up oxygen, that's called external respiration. And what happens here is carbon dioxide unloading also happens. So your blood is also, while this is happening, your blood is also going to get rid of some carbon dioxide and release it into the alveoli of your lungs so it can be exhaled. 